The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Bomber, Deputy Director of the Colorado Municipal League. Thank you for attending today's webinar. I'm here with the CML Advocacy Team, with one exception I'll mention in just a second. We're excited to share the latest news on what's happening at the State House. Those of you who are elected officials who have registered will receive one university training credit. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website, www.cml.org, under training materials. For those of you who aren't familiar with the webinar format, you should see a control panel at the top right of your screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of the panel, which will minimize the entire box. All participants will be muted for the webinar, but are encouraged to ask questions throughout by typing them into the question box on the control panel. We'll be sure to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So with me today here at CML are CML's legislative and policy advocates, Morgan Cullen and Brandy DeLang, and joining us remotely is Megan Dollar, and we will bring her in shortly. Uh, so with that, we will get underway. Uh, so here is the contact information for CML's lobbyists. Pretty easy, first initial, last name. Four of us are your uh, representatives at the State House. And what we're going to be talking about today are some of the issues that are confronting municipalities uh, during this upcoming legislative session. But we first wanted to start off by showing you how you can access that information at any time. Uh, so uh, this is a screenshot of our web page. Uh, and a screenshot of a YouTube video of some odd talking head. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. I want to switch over to our website because I want to show you how to easily find this page should you want to. Uh, on CML's website, www.cml.org, under legislative, you can click that, but if you want to go right to the 2019 legislative session page, it will show you uh, uh, our latest and greatest information. So right up front is our CML legislative priorities. If you click on that link, it'll open up a, a list of our legislative priorities that we have provided to uh, legislators and other policymakers. Uh, and that's worth taking a look at as the main issues that we presented to the General Assembly to start the session. Uh, our weekly CML Statehouse report is an online publication. We do. We're, as soon as we're wrapped up with this, we'll be getting ready to record uh, this week's edition and update uh, the legislation on our State House Report page. That, uh, if you click on the State House Report, it will open up a page that lists all of the bills that we're following uh, that are current anyway. It may not be every bill that we're following, but those that uh, there's something to report on their status and a little bit about them. If you want to see all of the bills that we are following and their current status, uh, over here on the right side, you can click on. House of Representatives, that'll open up a box score, I'm sorry, a list of House bills. And then under Senate, we'll open up a list of Senate bills. And if you just want a simple list of bills on which CML has positions or is recommending positions to the CML Board or Policy Committee, you can click on that full list of CML support and opposed bills, and that opens up in a separate page. Um, so that is, uh, that is the basic info page as we start to develop and uh, publish and hand out to legislators uh, specific position papers on specific legislation. Those will also appear on this page. And then you also note we've got a link to our annual legislative workshop, which is coming up on Thursday, February 14th, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So that is the easy way to access info on up to the up to the minute info on our 2019 legislative session and issues, uh, which I thought was a little bit better than just showing a screenshot. Uh, so there you go. Um, so let's dive right into the issues affecting municipalities and start first at the state level on uh, state issues affecting municipalities, uh, state budget, transportation funding, sales tax, Gallagher Amendment, and Tabor. You're going to hear a lot about these, probably some others, uh, throughout the session, but these are ones that we've flagged. We'll talk a little bit about some of them uh, upcoming. Uh, but to the extent that they are being discussed as statewide policy issues, you can most certainly uh, expect us to be talking about them and their impact on municipalities. I always like to take a moment to talk about the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights at the state level, uh, Tabor and what it is doing uh, in, in regard to uh, the state budget, which does impact municipalities in a few key areas. Uh, this graph, uh, I like this is done as part of the forecast. This is from the December forecast. 
And what I think is critically important to, uh, to pay attention to is the Tabor surplus line, which is on the referendum C cap. Uh, it, it's always interesting to note if we'd not had referendum C, that line that shows the Tabor base limit would be showing how far above that old Tabor limit uh, that the ratchet down effect caused, how far above we would be uh, at least somewhat indicative of how much would have had to been cut from the state budget to remain in compliance in Tabor or how much would have been refunded to, to voters. But as you note, in the 1819 fiscal year and 1920 fiscal year, there are Tabor refunds projected that we will exceed the referendum C cap. And uh, that has drawn a lot of attention as to how that money should be used. And since it's one time money, uh, uh, you know, how can you reduce that or, or uh, use that a different way? Uh, and, uh, and how much will be refunded to voters? If you recall, back in the 14-15 session, you can see there was a slight uh, 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 exceedance of the Tabor cap. Um, some of that, a lot of that was due to the hospital provider fee, which was dealt with in subsequent years. Uh, and we also had a significant bump in severance tax revenues and a fairly robust economy. One of our main concerns uh, is that uh, during that year, in a period of robust economy, severance tax revenue was used to backfill the general fund uh, and uh, to supply money for the Tabor refund. Uh, that is something we adamantly oppose and will continue to oppose if it's proposed in the future. That is Brandy that will have the joy of working on that issue. So far, we haven't heard anything, but um, we're always concerned uh, that the legislature will go back. So uh, a lot of you deal with this on the local level, but uh, and, and you understand Tabor uh, well, but this is a, a really nice illustration that I stole from the prior um, director of the Office of State Planning and Budget but it shows that uh, what happens and how Tabor impacts uh, the, the uh, general, general fund and how refunds occur, that the income coming in, fees and income and sales taxes, uh, push the bucket up, push the level in the bucket up from the bottom. Uh, the Tabor limit, uh, that, that is a fixed line that cannot be adjusted. And when the uh, money coming in pushes the line above the, the spigot, then uh, the Tabor refund comes out. That is. That is only adjustable uh, in uh, a couple of different ways, uh, and they've, they've certainly done some uh, legal tricks to do so, but really the only way you can not have a Tabor refund is to reduce services, uh, and that's uh, tough to do in a growing economy. So this is gonna be a really critical issue going forward uh, as it impacts both the state and then how it uh, rolls down at the local level. Now we'll move into specific issues uh, and each of us will present and cover our issues. Uh, last year, this slide was a lot busier because there was a lot going on with beer and liquor. Uh, we are now past January 1st, 2019. Uh, fermented malt beverage now, for all intents and purposes, is the same as, for, as, uh, the same as malt liquor. Uh, there are some, oh, some, some aftershocks, I guess, uh, that are really occurring at the regulatory level. Uh, we don't expect any major legislation this session. There are a couple uh, bills that you'll see on our on our bill log that do some minor uh, tweaks to uh, the legislation. The good news is this will allow us to finally update our beer and liquor handbook uh, here in the next several months. Um, so the good news is, uh, I think, no beer and liquor legislation expected. So that will move on to brandy and broadband. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I think this year, as in past years, we'll see quite a bit of broadband legislation. In particular, we've seen our first major broadband bill drop um, from the Senate. This is Senate Bill 78, which would uh, disqualify those ISP users, or excuse me, those ISPs from receiving any money from the high cost support mechanism fund, that high cost fund that a lot of folks refer to, if they engage in uh, you know, anti-net neutrality type activities. So things like throttling or blocking lawful content. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this piece of legislation is that it would require local governments like ourselves to give preference to those ISPs who are compliant with open internet practices. So, you know, of course, there are some ongoing questions with this, whether or not um, there are some implications for those of you who may have ISPs who are leasing broadband from larger providers and um, figuring out what the hurdles may be for local governments if there are hurdles. So I think we'll have continued conversations with the bill sponsor on this one. 
Um, the other thing that, as we're all familiar with, and we've had previous conversations through the policy committee, is broadband easements. This is a really interesting conversation because not only is it a local conversation, but it's also a federal national conversation. Uh, last week, we uh, participated in a webinar conversation with uh, Senator Michael Bennett's office. Uh, talking about some of the challenges that are, uh, you know, that we're running into on the federal level. But in particular, the thing that I think most of us took away from that conversation was that really it seems like maybe the solution that we should be focusing on is the one that's uh, at the local level. So um, we know that Colorado Counties Incorporated is uh, working on some legislation currently, and we'll be seeing a bill draft here soon. We've been uh, actively engaged in that conversation, and we'll share as soon as we are able to get a hold of a draft. The last thing that I'd flag is um, a 152 repeal conversation. If you listen to the governor's state of the state about two weeks ago, he made some uh, allusions to the idea that he'd like to cut some red tape for local governments. What that means, I don't know. I think that we have some uh, real conversations to have with the governor and with the governor's staff, as well as some other lawmakers who are really interested in trying to help find solutions for municipal broadband. Um, and so I think uh, I think if you folks have some ideas or if there's something that you'd like for us to share with the governor or with lawmakers, please reach out to me so that I can uh, have some uh, positive conversations. Thanks, Brandy. And before we move on to the next slide, just a reminder that if at any time you have a question about anything we're talking about, type it into that question box and we'll make sure to come back to them all at the end. So with that, we're going to move on to Megan and housing. Take it away, Megan. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so like in previous years, uh, 2019, we'll have a lot of discussions around housing and homelessness in general. Um, what we'll probably likely see um, some some legislation um, with the intent to permanent find a permanent funding uh, resource for affordable housing at the state level. CML typically supported those. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that the legislature can go about it. In the past, there have been uh, pieces of legislation that have looked at it two ways. One is a document recording fee. What that is is a, a fee that's charged at the county level that could um, has in previous pieces of legislation has gone up to almost five dollars. Um, that allows uh, allows some of that funding for. Um, excuse me, sorry, my phone is being a little weird. Um, let me start over. So, so the document recording fee allows is goes to um, uh, all documents, not just real estate documents, and can be particularly high uh, and potentially a good funding source for affordable housing. A documentary fee is a fee that is lends, lends itself to specifically real estate um, documents and um, has been a lot more popular in the legis in the legislature. However, there are some. Uh, concerns from the real estate community. So more to come on that. I have yet to see um, a piece of legislation introduced uh, dealing with that yet. Um, another piece I want to talk about is uh, rent control. There's been a lot of discussion in the media so far that um, there are some interested legislators that uh, right now uh, in statute language uh, specifically prohibits local governments from enacting rent control uh, in their uh, prospective municipalities. There is a senator that's interested in removing that prohibition. So that will definitely be something that CML will get, uh, will um, be involved on and, and perhaps want to see move forward. Um, and then finally, um, and then finally, uh, we will see again the Right to Rest Act this year. This is one that establishes certain rights for per persons experiencing homelessness. Um, this is a response to municipalities uh, looking at camping vans. Um, and other ordinances that um, homeless advocates are viewing as criminalizing homelessness. And uh, so that is something that CML has opposed in the past and will likely do so again this year. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to employment issues. Um, so there are several items in this category that have been introduced in previous sessions and the league has generally monitored them uh, because with split chambers, they really weren't gonna go anywhere anyway, so we expended our political capital elsewhere. Uh, that's not gonna be the case in 2019, we think. And uh, so here are a couple to keep an eye on, uh, not all introduced yet, some are. 
Uh, one is a prohibition on asking on an application form about criminal history. This is called the ban the box bill. It's a little bit different this year uh, in that the initial prohibition is still there. Um, however, an employer is uh, free to uh, to do a criminal history background check on an applicant at any point in time. Um, I indicated to the fiscal analyst on this that um, uh, where some candidates would have disqualified themselves for a criminal history that uh, disqualify them for the position by disclosing on the form. Uh, now, if we have to run a background check on everyone, that's going to increase cost uh, to, to local taxpayers. Uh, we'll see if that makes it into the fiscal note. Um, the family medical leave, this is an employee payroll deduction, deduction to uh, fund an enterprise that would be created at the state level uh, so that employees would uh, have uh, funding available to take uh, eligible family uh, leave. It's um, uh, essentially a state version of Family Medical Leave Act, but with some uh, uh, with some uh, uh, revenue to assist the employee on leave. It, uh, it does apply to both the public and private sector. There is no small employer exemption. Uh, so there is uh, some indirect impact from that in terms of uh, uh, how smaller employers in particular deal with the uh, loss of employee. That's still an issue. Uh, my understanding from discussions with various municipalities is that uh, in some way, shape, or form, uh, municipal employers uh, try to do this to the greatest extent practicable anyway, uh, and certainly provide leave, uh, oftentimes even if they're not subject to the Federal Family uh, Medical Leave Act. Um, and last, and this will probably be the one that gets a lot of airtime, is uh, local government authority to establish a higher minimum wage. This bill, uh, versions of this bill have been introduced in prior sessions. The league has not ever taken a position on them because even though they uh, purport to uh, eliminate an existing preemption on municipalities and counties to have uh, authority to establish a higher minimum wage than uh, what the state minimum wage is, uh, simply removing the preemption that has been proposed would not uh, solve the problem. That has to do with the, uh, sort of some complicated prior Supreme Court decisions impacting private uh, wage uh, issues and uh, has not um, uh, that those nothing has changed those case uh, those cases or the uh, interpretations of law. What has changed is a constitutional amendment with establishing a statewide minimum wage. Uh, and what we expect is legislation introduced this year would give explicit authority to local governments to exceed that. Um, if that happens, then uh, that probably withstands legal muster and uh, we'll be having a conversation likely in the February policy committee meeting about whether or not as a local control matter the league should be supportive of that or not. So stay tuned on that. Um, I do expect that to be a very robust discussion. On to marijuana. We'll have two things come back this year uh, for sure. I just don't know yet because no one has shared uh, in what forms they'll come back. On-premise consumption. Uh, we saw a couple different versions of that last year. Uh, the uh, one that was uh, essentially a smoking club uh, died in committee. Uh, the other was accessory consumption establishments, um, essentially attached to existing retail. Uh, in both cases, they were uh, at uh, local option and subject to uh, more stringent local regulation. Uh, the governor vetoed the uh, governor Hickenlooper vetoed the uh, accessory consumption establishments. Uh, if we see those come back, um, it, I, I have no doubt that they'll have the same local control element. We were uh, ultimately uh, neutral on the bills because they, they uh, did have the local control. Uh, delivery will come back again. It was a pilot program proposed last year. It was very convoluted. Uh, the league, league didn't take a position on it, uh, not because it was good or bad policy, but because it was so convoluted that no municipality was ever going to opt into it. We didn't need to waste any time on it. Maybe a little different this year. They put some thought into it. Would still be a local opt-in. Uh, I've not seen any language yet, uh, but um, I think that for us the big question is whether or not it will uh, say explicitly that no delivery uh, may be made into a municipality that has opted out of uh, retail sales of Amendment 64. That's a, a fairly important one that we have uh, uh, been consistent on. So that's uh, that's marijuana. Um, Megan, going to turn it back to you for municipal courts. Thank you. Uh, the big focus of this session, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen that just based on what you've been hearing from your legislators, is criminal justice reform, and municipal courts are certainly a part of that. Um, 
so so far we've uh, what I've heard uh, will be surrounding or reform will specifically surround um, a lot of sentencing reforms as well as bail and bond reform. Uh, bail and bond reform will specifically affect municipal courts. Um, that's been an ongoing discussion. And it, there's not a bill that's ready for prime time just yet, but we do have municipal judges that are part of that conversation as well as myself. Uh, the lead entity on debating uh, potential bail and bond reform is the uh, Colorado, or excuse me, the Commission on Civil and Crim or excuse me, Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, which is a commission at the state level under the Department of Public Safety um, that uh, convenes all types of stakeholders in order to. Uh, create policy, uh, criminal justice policy for the state. So more to come on that issue specifically, but CML uh, is playing an active role in that discussion. Uh, the other piece uh, will uh, specifically has to do with outstanding judgment warrants. Outstanding judgment warrants are a tool that municipal courts use as well as county courts um, in order to, so if someone um, does not fulfill their sentence or does not attend their um, set court date, um, what may happen is a municipal court may send out a, an outstanding judgment warrant or an OJW. If someone has an OJW, what that means is the state uh, Department of Revenue will suspend or cancel that person's license so they are no longer to, uh, able to drive uh, until they settle up um, their either their sentence or uh, work it out with the court. Um, the ACLU and other proponents have been attempting to remove outstanding judgment warrants as a tool. Uh, they did so last year. Uh, that bill did not pass due to the significant fiscal impact to the state. I have not seen a bill um, yet on outstanding judgment warrants, but we do expect uh, something to at least remove the teeth from them, and that is a huge concern for municipal courts. Okay, thanks, Megan. And now we will move on to oil and, I'm sorry, municipal tax and finance, got ahead of myself. Um, this is me, uh, so two, two areas here, sales tax and property tax. The sales tax is where, uh, obviously, from a municipal perspective, I've spent most of my time, uh, and most of that with the Interim Sales and Use Tax Simplification Task Force, which has one bill, uh, uh, requiring an RFP for a single point of remittance to be issued by the Department of Revenue. The League is supportive of that legislation um, uh, because we have laid down the caveat, um, uh, first of all, that it be voluntary for home rule, self-collecting home rule municipal participation, since it can't mandate participation. And then uh, it, if the system is ever developed for businesses to be able to have a single point of remittance for sales taxes, then, and it's functional, uh, we retain our constitutional home rule authority and maintain our existing base and audit authority. At that time, uh, munis home rule municipalities uh, may look at it and say that really works um, as well as uh, our current system and uh, will participate to help simplify uh, for businesses in their community. So, uh, and, and businesses that remit taxes to their municipality. So, but that is a long-term sort of a shining star on the horizon approach uh, that uh, we're supporting. Hopefully it works out. We'll see. The, the noise, and I'm sure many of you heard about it within your communities from your local businesses, and we certainly understand that, had to do with state rulemaking, which has now been uh, suspended, or the rules have been adopted, but the uh, enforcement of the rules has been suspended until the end of May, dealing with a uh, point of delivery. Well, what are we talking about here? Not self-collecting home rule municipalities, but uh, rather the state of Colorado and any licenses which it's, or any taxes which it administers for statutory municipalities or 24 non-self-collecting home rural municipalities plus any districts or counties, et cetera. And the rule essentially said that uh, if a business uh, makes a sale and delivers uh, to another municipality that is a statutory municipality, for example, or whatever the point of delivery is, that that business has to collect and remit any sales tax uh, due uh, under this that's covered under the state sales tax license. Um, that obviously uh, created a, a huge concern for businesses. Actually, a lot of nonprofits like the Municipal League too. That um, we sell things around the state and uh, publications and whatnot. So it would certainly impact the league as well. Uh, that was all suspended. 
There is a lot of discussion about how to address this issue legislatively. Uh, we may see, uh, we will see uh, at least a, uh, a de minimis approach where anyone under a certain uh, number of transactions or a dollar limit, not yet established what that might be, would be exempt from the point of delivery requirement, uh, would still have to collect or would still have to remit their state sales tax, but would be exempt from the other ones. Um, that may be acceptable uh, as long as they stay out of also trying to apply that to use tax, which is a draft of one bill I saw. Um, and, and then some various other variations on a the theme um, uh, in that department. Uh, but, but for harmonization with the Wayfair decision, uh, where remote sellers uh, will have to um, collect and remit the tax, ultimately based on the point of delivery, having that the same for both in-state and remote sales uh, makes sense. It's just got to be done in the most efficient way possible, and it ties into this long-term goal of having a single portal. Property tax is, a, is obviously a, a big uh, constitutional fish that has to be slayed here and how to deal with Gallagher uh, among it. So the preliminary residential assessment um, uh, report from the uh, Division of Property Taxation was just released. Um, the uh, preliminary uh, expect, or, uh, um, assessment of what the rate would reduce to uh, is down to 695 from 72, which is actually a much less significant drop than uh, than the legislature's legislative council predicted, and a lot of people feared. Now it's a preliminary number, uh, so things could change. The last time this happened as a preliminary number, the the initial number um, actually ended up being lower than what what they arrived at. I don't know if that's going to happen this time, uh, but at least this helps relieve some pressure on the discussion at the state house about uh, referring a. Uh, a question to the ballot and when that would occur and what exactly it would do to Gallagher and those there are a lot of options on the table there that are still being discussed so stay tuned I know that um, uh, as a municipal issue it is not as big but it certainly Im impacts uh, uh, the local government family and certainly local governments um, uh, that you interact with uh, which can also have an indirect effect so we're, we're definitely paying very close attention to that and now oil and gas. All right, thank you. Um, so as many folks know, on Monday, the Colorado Supreme Court uh, came down with a ruling in favor of the COCC's decision to decline new rulemaking um, pertaining to the Martinez case. And in particular, uh, the, the proponents, uh, um, uh, the proponents, Martinez and other fellows, asked that uh, the COCC would consider fostering responsible and balanced de development um, and, and consider third-party consultation uh, on environmental impacts. Ultimately, the, the Supreme Court decided that really the objective here of the COGCC is to balance and foster uh, oil and gas development with um, you know, the needs of, of the state. So uh, this is a really interesting development. I think that currently the oil and gas industry is viewing this as a win, um, but you know, the, the proof is in the pudding and I think that we're all really kind of anticipating a landslide of legislation that will directly address the concerns identified in the Martinez case. Um, this is something that we know will, um, you know, will have a lot of impacts on local governments in particular, um, especially if some of that language is not uh, uh, shared with us to begin with. So we've reached out to um, bill sponsors that we think will be uh, running some legislation that could potentially impact us. They've agreed to keep us in the loop. So hopefully as soon as they've started to draft something that they're willing to share with us, we can uh, reach out to folks and, and get some input. Um, the other thing I would just flag is that likely we'll also hear a lot of conversations around what local control actually looks like and how um, how we should be involved in those conversations. I think Kevin said this in the past, but often a lot of folks will try to say, well, we've already figured it out and we just want to give you guys everything that we can. Um, I think that what uh, the message is from us down at the State House is, yes, uh, we're really happy to have those conversations, but please make sure that you're actually including us at the table rather than prescribing to us what local control looks like. So again, much like with the broadband conversation, if you have something that you want shared, please uh, reach out to me and I'll be sure to, to get it involved in the conversation, get it mixed in the conversation. 
And just to piggyback on that, um, uh, Brandy's done a great job on this. You'll note the uh, approach that the league has tried to take, not knowing exactly, certainly not predicting the Martinez decision one way or the other, but in our legislative priorities that I mentioned earlier, you'll see how we have taken a, a you know a fairly broad and moderate approach to that. That the that the league is uh, is supportive of reasonable uh, increases in local control and land use siting authority, very similar uh, to the that which we have in any other industrial use. So that you know that's local control. Um, and we certainly Brandy's done a good job of this, is talking to legislators about it. Uh, we just want to make sure that. Uh, when, and when they're advocating for local control, they're actually talking to local governments uh, about it, and, and uh, we'll, we'll be there to make sure that they are. Um, so with that, we're back to uh, Megan again. Thank you. All right, um, so let's talk about the, uh, excuse me, I have some dogs barking in the background. Sit, Fido. Um, my apologies. <laughs> All right, so let's talk, um, so the opioid epidemic. So the uh, Opioid Interim Study Committee, it's oh, it called the Opioid and Substance Abuse Interim Study Committee, uh, met over the summer and um, ha will be introducing several bills from that from that committee. CML is particularly interested in two of those bills. Um, and what I will do is, uh, for in the interest of time, is really talk about it, because those two bills do quite a bit. Um, but talk about why CML um, will be supporting both of these. So the first one is Senate Bill 008, and what that bill does is it has to do with substance abuse and the criminal justice system. Um, the bill adds certain drug offenses to um, what is already a streamlined record sealing process. Um, the, re the record sealing process that I'm referring to was actually developed um, two years ago with the help of CML and it allows for lower level uh, offenses to be sealed uh, at the court where they were given as opposed to one having to go to the district court uh, to get that offense um, sealed. Uh, the other piece of the legislation that is really critical um, for municipalities uh, increases funding for um, through the Department of Human Services for uh, law enforcement assisted diversion programs or otherwise known as LEAD. Right now there are two programs, uh, uh, well there's four in the state um, two of them in municipalities uh, in Alamosa, as well as the city of Longmont. Uh, additionally, the city, county, and Denver does receive funds as well for LEAD. Um, what this bill does is allow uh, law enforcement to take individuals that are would otherwise be held in the court system or in, uh, in custody for low-level drug offenses, possession, uh, things of that nature, to get them directly into treatment so that you don't have someone that's in the cycle of the court system. It, it's been a very successful program, uh, both in Longmont and Alamosa, and so CML supporting this bill uh, in order to increase that funding and perhaps spread that program to other municipalities. Uh, the second one has to do with recovery from substance abuse, um, and that is HB 19-1009. The big part of this bill is that it creates a state license for sober living homes. There's been some discussion over the last few years uh, within municipalities on um, local abilities to, to regulate sober living homes. Um, because those, those that um, are addicted to substances are considered a, a protected class under federal law, there is not a, a lot that municipalities could do in terms of regulation that wouldn't be, that could potentially be not be thought of by the uh, federal government as uh, being discriminatory um, to those that are re uh, recovering from substance abuse. What this does is create a state license at the um, in, within the Department of Public um, Health and Environment um, so that there is some regulatory entity that is looking over um, those, those entities and it also allows municipalities to, to send um, sober living homes within their communities um, to the state to make sure that those that already existing sober li living homes do follow those as well. Uh, finally, uh, red light cameras and speed radar. This is a per for those of you that have these in your communities. Um, this is a perennial issue. That bill has already been introduced, um, but there is a, a bill to prohibit the use of red light cameras and speed, our speed radar vans within municipalities. Um, it also prohibits the state from doing so as well. Uh, like many years in the past, we will certainly oppose that bill um, as we believe that this needs to be a local decision uh, as we make all of our traffic decisions locally. 
Um, and so we'll um, hopefully be able to defeat that legislation this year as well. Great, Megan, thank you. Uh, Megan will be staying on the line in the event anyone has any questions in her subject areas. So please uh, remember if you do, go to the question box, uh, you can type stuff in and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be answering questions at the end. So with that, we're going to go to Morgan. So uh, with unified uh, government control in Democratic hands down at the G Colorado General Assembly this year, uh, sustainability issues uh, will be a primary area of focus uh, going forward. Uh, as it relates to CML um, and local government issues, uh, one issue uh, that is uh, gaining a, a lot of attention among our membership right now uh, has to do with uh, CRS 2517-104, uh, which actually sits in the uh, recycling section of uh, the state statutes. Um, but uh, interestingly, it's a statewide uh, preemption on local authority uh, to prohibit certain types of plastic products. Uh, and this is an issue uh, that has gotten more and more attention as public awareness around single-use plastic products um, and the environmental concerns associated with them uh, has pressured local uh, town boards and city uh, councils across the state to consider um, sub some type of prohibition on some of these products. So um, it's CML uh, 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 on behest of our membership uh, has uh, requested and received um, a uh, authority uh, to repeal uh, the statutory preemption uh, through CML initiated legislation if necessary, uh, and we will be per pursuing that in the 2019 session. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, Governor Polis, uh, or then candidate Governor Polis, made a, a cornerstone of his uh, campaign uh, the goal of reaching 100% renewable energy by 2040. It was also a centerpiece of his State of the State address uh, last uh, week. Um, uh, what we haven't seen uh, is it manifest itself in any kind of legislation down at the Capitol this session, uh, but it will be of uh, key interest to our members. Uh, right now, eight municipalities have actually passed a similar directive uh, that is consistent with the governor's, um, uh, with the governor's goals. Uh, um, but uh, what actual legislation looks like uh, and how it will impact our communities uh, going forward will be of key interest uh, to CML. And then uh, transportation, uh, and obviously the, the biggest priority uh, regarding transportation issues in recent years has been uh, the uh, transportation funding or lack thereof. Uh, so any conversation uh, beginning in 2019, I think we'll have to start with uh, the comprehensive uh, legislation that was passed in 2018, Senate Bill 1. Uh, and two things um, that are uh, carryovers from Senate Bill 1. Uh, one is there's gonna be an additional 150 million general fund appropriation uh, that will go directly to uh, the HUTF. Uh, and that actually has, a, uh, just like last year's $495 million appropriation, has a local share back. Uh, and that's a $22.5 million split evenly between cities and counties. Uh, so CML will be looking to protect that. Also, uh, since uh, Senate Bill, or I'm sorry, initiatives uh, 109 and 110 did not pass last fall, um, it, Senate Bill 1 stipulates that a $2.34 billion bonding measure will be referred to voters in 2019. And we'll see how that moves forward uh, under uh, uh, right now. Or if it comes out. Yeah, or if it comes out completely. Um, and then uh, along with that, um, the, just the systemic issues uh, regarding the 22 cent a, a gallon gas tax. Um, there is long term, we need to figure out a long term funding, trans, uh, funding strategy for transportation going forward. CML has been committed to a statewide comprehensive uh, uh, plan um, that helps to fund uh, transportation projects at all level go of government. Uh, with the defeat of 109 and 110 at the ballot box in 2018, uh, trying to figure out a solution um, is going to be tricky for the Colorado General Assembly. So whether or not they want to put another something else on the ballot um, that would help to um, uh, increase revenues uh, or a uh, deep bruising um, uh, or uh, a look at, uh, at uh, fees uh, that could be could be implemented uh, through legislation. Uh, all remains to be seen, uh, but we'll be keeping a close eye on it. And of course, not to mention that 
the failure of those has also spurred a lot of local discussions about individual questions or regional approaches, and, and it's a fine mess that it's all gotten us into, right? Um, okay, that is the end of our subject matter presentation. Now, again, if there's something you want us to answer about any of that, something we didn't talk about that you want to hear more about, uh, just let me know. I am going to quickly go through um, a, a few more slides on how you can stay abreast of the uh, most current information and how you can be part of the process because uh, you are uh, you are the folks that are closest to municipal issues and uh, you can help us greatly uh, with your individual legislators. Um, so first of all, how CML keeps you informed. We've uh, got our CML Statehouse report I, I pointed out on our website. You can sign up to have that delivered to your inbox. I uh, showed you the uh, legislative page. It's where we keep our position papers, our box score, social media. Uh, in, in addition to uh, the CML, uh, Facebook, and uh, Twitter pages, you can also uh, follow Sam or myself for sure. And uh, we usually are pretty good about talking about things that impact municipalities. Um, this morning I retweeted, as did the League, a, a business journal article on uh, sales tax, which was most interesting to say the least. Um, uh, we also have our annual Colorado Laws Enacted Affecting Municipalities publication. When the dust settles, we write about uh, things that passed and how they impact municipalities. And we also, um, where appropriate, uh, put things in our newsletter and in our magazine. Um, and I talked, I said, you're the, you're the folks that are closest to the issues, and uh, uh, there are four of us at the State House, but there are a lot of you, and the, the legislators hear from us quite a bit. Uh, certainly on your issues, and that, uh, and that's obviously what we're there for, uh, but they also like hearing from home base, and not just when there's a problem, but also when things are going well. So let's talk about that first. Who is my legislator? Well, there are resources for that uh, on the CML web page, but actually uh, the best place to go is to the Colorado General Assembly's website. It has a really great tool. You Now you can just enter your address to see who your legislators are. Um, if you need that link, um, then uh, email me at kbomber at cml.org, k-b-o-m-m-e-r at cml.org, and I'll send it to you. Um, we also link to that on, uh, on our website. Uh, what's the best way to contact my legislator? Well, even with all of the fancy tools, electronic tools available, um, boy, in-person and face-to-face -face is still the best way. When they're back in the district, uh, invite them to uh, a, a board or council meeting, do a special event. Uh, and like I said, talk to them about what's going well, things that you're, uh, thing, how things are going in your municipality so that when we do have to contact them about an issue or a problem and a specific request, um, it's not the first time uh, that they've heard from us. Uh, email and phone, obviously, um, I should have included text on there because, uh, boy, how is, howdy, is that a, a major league form of communication? Uh, but whatever... Uh, whatever way they uh, prefer to is also something to take into account. You should also invite them to the CML Legislative Reception on uh, February 14th here at the League Building, uh, starting to end a little bit earlier this year uh, so that we can accommodate people's Valentine's Day plans. We don't want to step on those. So what should you say when you're talking to your legislators? Well, first of all, talk to them about legislative and policy issues that specifically affect your municipality, but please, please, please always check and see um, uh, where CML's positions on bills are. Uh, again, the bill logs and position papers are on our website, and uh, all, you can always direct them to uh, seek out or direct us to seek them out uh, for more detail in the state house. And just really let them know you appreciate their vote. And I would also add, tell them how much you appreciate their service. That counts. That matters, and they do. Uh, they do remember that stuff. We also have the Ten Commandments of Effective Legislative Relations. Um, and become aware of legislation. We've got the tools for you to do that, uh, both on what the legislation CML is actually following, but what, if any, position we have and, and our description of it. Certainly know your legislators and be well informed on the issues. Um, it, communicate regularly and be persistent. Uh, work with outside groups, but in the same respect, coalitions can work, but be cautious. Uh, you. Uh, your, your friends are your friends until they are not, and your interests uh, diverge. Uh, so always be aware that working in coalitions can be helpful to get things done as long as you're all on the same page. Always say thank you, um, even when someone uh, tells you something you don't want to hear. 
uh, or tells you you're wrong, uh, say thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for listening. Thanks for taking the time. Act quickly. Uh, you will see occasionally throughout the session, hopefully not that often, but you will see action alerts come from CML or you may hear something. Uh, don't sit on it. Uh, sometimes, especially as we get later in the session, things can move pretty quickly. The quicker you act, get information before um, a legislator, uh, they can't say, well, I never heard from anyone, so um, that's how I voted. Um, it really, this is helpful as well. When you do have a conversation with the legislator, um, uh, about uh, an issue, particularly one that's uh, one that CML is following, uh, let let us know um, because we can certainly incorporate that. That helps us out, um, not because we need to know every what everything's doing all the time, but it also it helps us know um, whether or not we're uh, approaching a legislator too much, whether or not they've already made a commitment on something, uh, or whether there's more work to do, and uh, and the ABCs. Uh, uh, do I remember the ABCs? Uh, always be courteous. So um, the, the, the worst thing you can do is with a, a legislator is, uh, is act angry with them, even when they give you a good reason to. Uh, just take the time to say thank you and how much you appreciate them, uh, because the next time uh, it may matter. Uh, and so uh, how much do you want to be part of all the action? Well, that is largely up to you. Um, the last one I'll start with first. Come join us at the State House. Uh, if you uh, see something or want to know when something is going to be discussed in a committee, uh, or you want to try and talk to a legislator about an issue uh, that may not necessarily be in committee, then we can help arrange that. But come see us, give us a little heads up, and we will make all the appropriate arrangements uh, uh, to try to get you before a committee or to talk to your legislator. Uh, if it's uh, something that you're interested and excited about, we can get you out on the uh, out on the House or Senate floor, as long as you're not a registered lobbyist, and uh, happy to do that. But also, there are other ways. Uh, I think I plugged this a couple times, but I'll do it again. Come to the Legislative Workshop. Uh, that's on February 14th at History Colorado. We'll have our legislative reception afterwards. Uh, we're going to do uh, sessions on sales tax uh, and transportation. Uh, we're going to get a federal update. Uh, the, the governor has uh, been invited. We're still working to get that confirmation uh, as well. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a good day, uh, I think. Well, I hope one of the uh, uh, important sessions is the one where the league lobbyists give you the latest and greatest on what's going on and, and uh, give you time to ask us a little bit more about that. Again, sign up for the CML Statehouse Report. And then uh, you'll see this uh, pop up throughout the year, but we have a Legislative Matters blog at uh, legislativematters.wordpress.com. It's also, you can link specifically or directly to it through the website uh, on the blog links at uh, cml.org. Uh, and uh, we do that um, every now and then uh, and uh, try to endeavor to do it more frequently through the leg legislative session. Well, I just went through everything there. Um, so that is the end of the presentation. I uh, want to thank you for your time. I want to just allow a couple minutes to see if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask. So I'm going to open up to see if there's first any questions. I don't see any, uh, but give you all um, a minute or two uh, to post any questions on anything we talked about or anything we didn't talk about. So we'll take a couple minutes and see if you have any questions. I don't have any music and I'm not going to hum, so ask soon. And don't be shy. Again, if you want to ask a question, uh, the question box on your control panel, just open that up, type it in, click send, and uh, we'll be happy to answer it. Okay, one minute countdown. I'm not seeing any questions. We'll go one more minute and then we'll wrap it up. So any questions, please ask them. 
Uh, if there's something that you want to ask us more directly about, it doesn't have to be here. You can email us or call us um, uh, absolutely anytime. Got a question um, uh, about whether or not we can send the slides. We'll post the slides uh, along with the audio on the training materials page on our website. Okay, well, like a doctor in the ER, I am calling it at uh, 12.50 and 52 seconds. Uh, we want to thank you all for your participation. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll do another one of these in April, uh, the date to be finalized and will be posted on our events page. Uh, again, between now and then, if you have any questions, if you uh, need more information, you don't find it on the website, just reach out to us directly. Thanks again and uh, enjoy your weekend.